once you build up to a thousand cards or so, it gets harder and harder to identify them. But there's a lot of ways to do it. With this video today, I have four sections like normal. The first thing I'm going to go through is the what's sold. I have, let's see, nine cards sold on eBay, zero on Etsy. So the ones on eBay are sold for $50. And then I got two action figures that I sold for $45. So I had a total of $95 in sales. Up and down. It just whatever comes in every day. Then I have the special topic. And that's usually a section where I talk about a certain type of postcard. Well, I kind of changed it up a little bit. Instead of doing a novelty postcard or the weird ones, I did a normal, everyday, common, very common postcard type. Washington, D.C. postcards. We're going to talk about those. I got some facts about Washington, D.C. and the sell-through rate on them. And also go over some of the pricing. So when people see those, they're, they're very common. But there might be some out there that you want to look for. Then I did one of those polls. This is not touching on the edge of things when you start talking to resellers that I usually don't talk about is shipping, how much tape you use, pricing. I asked, do you use a SKU number for your postcard inventory? I always ask about inventory because it's the most one of the most important things to get a system in place right from the start. Because you get to a point there's no there's a point of no return when you get so many cards. So you got to set up a good system. So ask me a lot of questions about postcard inventory. Then I got about three viewer comments in there that I pulled from different places to go over at the end. So you want to stick around for that. That's more of a ad hoc, ad lib part of it. Uh, just respond to my opinions. But let's go ahead and get started on what's sold. So I sold nine cards on eBay. Let's see what I got here. I sold the elephants in a zoo in Chicago. Divided back card, it's kind of an older card. I can, I can feel it from down there. Sold between four and five dollars. Must be Animal Day because I sold the Rosette spoon bills. These were spoon bills. <laughs> Those are spoon bills. A lady bought two cards about spoon bills. Now, when you go and set up your store, everybody looking through postcards, would you have listed spoon bills? Would you go out and try to comp spoon bills? Who would think spoon bills is something? This is what I mean about people collecting things that you never think about. So a long time ago, I stopped trying to figure out what people are collecting. But spoon bills, they are kind of cool birds if you look at them. And she likes them. Maybe she's a zoo person. But you never know. So I just listed in $4 to $5. So I got $10, 9 to $10 for two spoon bill postcards. Who knew? Then we got this card here. This is some uh, aluminum thing. This is like a home improvement ad card or something. So I look at that lady standing there at the doorway. Vertical card up and down. It was posted in 1962, 63 on there. Just like an advertisement type thing that they sent out to people. Four to five dollars. Then I sold the charcoal pit, I think it's called. Yeah, the charcoal pit, it's a barbecue house or some broiled steaks it's a restaurant multi view two views on there and that's located in doesn't say I think it's in New Jersey the charcoal pit four to five dollars then I sold Dallas I don't know if you guys remember that show Dallas who shot JR South Fork Ranch Dallas just a chrome card Two famous Texas landmarks, the Dallas Skyline and the South Fork Ranch Gate. I guess those are landmarks out there. So sold between 4 and $5, 1987 Next one is just a resort. This is the Alpine Resort Private Pier, Egg Harbor, Wisconsin. So somebody went there. It's just a resort, a view card of the lake and some boats. 4 to $5. Animal Day. Lobsters. This card probably sold because it's nice and blue and red. It probably stuck out on eBay in the listings. But somebody liked the main lobsters before and after, it says. So, out of the ocean is this one. They're brown. And out of the pot is this one. So, I guess when you cook them, they turn red. I don't eat lobsters. I don't know. Uncooked, cooked. Cold, hot. 
lobsters. I remember one time when I worked in a pet shop, I actually put in a lobster tank in a grocery store, um, Marineland. It was a refrigerated tank we had to put in. It came all self-contained. I just pulled it out of the box, put it in, conditioned the water, turned it on, waited a couple days, and they put some lobsters in there. Might still be there. I have to stop by. That, that was years ago. The college of Lady Elms, Chicopee, Massachusetts. Just a college. Four to five dollars. Unposted. So, fifty dollars in postcards. Easy listers, not a lot of comping on those. And I got fifty dollars for them. So, I hardly have any time to buy, buy with those. So, I touched the postcard when I bought them, touched them when I scanned them, touched them when I list them, and touched it when I sold them. So, I only touched those cards basically four times and I got 50 bucks. I also sold a couple of these. These are basically 118 scale predators. Let me see if I can get a good picture of them. Right there, that's what he looks like. These, this was a new thing they came out with last year. I bought a couple cases of them. This is the crucified predator on there. This is that movie uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger was in the first one. And this is the Armored Crucified Predator. That The other one was Crucified. This is the Armored one. Well, so they're both this 118 scale. They're not the bigger ones. I sold a lot of those before. But these will be shipped out. And I got, how much for those? $45 for both of those uh, total. So my total for today is $95. Special topic. Like I said, I changed it up a little bit. I wanted just to grab a very common card. Because I get a lot of questions about Washington DC or you can't find comps and stuff or do they sell a lot of messages like that so I thought I would just pull one of the most common cards that you'll find out there and some are not as common as you'll see in the pricing but there's really not a lot of history about postcards in Washington DC it just falls into the arrows divided back and chrome and linen stuff so I thought I would go out and grab some interesting facts about Washington DC and while I do that I'll show you some of the cards I found pictures of cards for Washington DC that you'll see out there. Washington DC is 68 square miles. That's how big it is. In 1999, vandals were suspected of chopping down four DC cherry trees. So they thought there were some shenanigans going on. Turns out it was just a pair of beavers. So they were blaming people for chop, chopping down cherry trees, but it ended up being the beavers. The U.S. Capitol Building Dome is made up of 8,909,200 pounds of cast iron. That is one heavy dome. Cast iron is heavy. The sculpt sculptured head of Darth Vader is located on the northwest tower of the Washington National Cathedral amongst the gargoyles. So on the northwest tower, there's a Darth Vader sculpture. Never knew that. George Washington has a script. George Washington has a crypt in Washington, D.C. under the U.S. Capitol. But he's actually buried in Mount Vernon in the tomb. His Capitol crypt is empty. Or is it? The White House has 35 bathrooms. You could use one a, one a day for a month. President Hoover and Adams both kept alligators as pets in the White House. The Library of Congress is home to more than, than 170 million items. If you look carefully, you'll find a typo on the Lincoln Memorial. Yeah, a typo. They made a mistake. In the word future on the north wall, in the word future, it's an E instead of an F. So whoever built it got an F. But those are just some facts that I found about Washington, D.C. I like the beaver one. <laughs> they chewed up four trees and they thought people were doing it. But as you saw, those are the common cards going out there. And I've, I've added this to the pricing in the last few videos, and I'll probably continue doing it, this sell-through rate. And a lot of people really think it's cryptic, it's hard to understand. It's not. Sell-through rate is basically the sold divided by listed times 100. And all the 100 does is move the decimal point to make it a percent. So the sell-through rate for what I put in eBay Postcard space, Washington space, D.C., there's 43,000 cards listed. Now, that's just what eBay showed me. There's a little plus sign after that, but it says there's 43,000 postcards plus. So I took the 43,000, and then I clicked on the sold. 
filtered it by sold. And they say there's 2,300 sold out there. So as a calculation before, as you take the sold divided by the listing times 100, it's a 5% sell-through rate. Again, it doesn't mean anything unless you compare it to other things. So I've done this with all 50 states and a lot of other things, and I grabbed a few here that I've been using, and I will update this every three months or so. It doesn't change. It changes, but it doesn't change as often that I need to go through it. But Nevada is at 11%. That's one of the higher ones. Indiana is 8%. Texas is 7 and the lower, one of the lower ones is New Hampshire. So Washington, D.C. is in the lower range. It's below average sell-through rate for those cards, and that's probably because they're common targeted market and there's just a lot of them out there 43,000 five percent sell to rate I would be looking for anything over eight percent to really key in on stuff but if I do get them I do list them but I, I do have a lot of them so I don't list a lot of the cherry trees the Monticello the oh that's not there uh, the Jefferson Memorial well, the Capitol White House a lot of those unless they're night scenes I pretty much don't list too many of them anymore because I, I have a lot of them. But with the 5% sell-through rate, I'm not really missing much. Let's look at some of the pricing I found out there. The sold high, sold low. So solds are more, are more important because those are the actual sold ones. And then I look at what people are listing them for and what the, the high and lows. And it gives me a well-rounded picture. A lot of people don't care about listed. I do it because I want to see the whole picture real quick. Just to see what people are listing. What's my competition, my real competition listing these things for? And as we know with postcards, they go from 99 cents up to the sky. But the first three for sold high, this was probably the highest one I found. I throw out the real top ones and I throw out the real bottom ones and kind of get the average. Because that's what I find. That's where I deal in. I don't deal with the top cards or the low, low cards. I kind of stay in the average. But this is a RPPC postcard showing Women's Suffrage Parade in Washington, D.C. There's a couple key words in here that you want to look for as you look for postcards. One is RPPC, and the next one is Women's Suffrage. Those are very unique cards in some areas. Kind of a topic that you got to be touchy with sometimes, but it was part of history. But Women's Suffrage Parade in Washington, D.C. went for almost, went for like $100. So look for Women's Suffrage cards back in those days. $98. Now I think he put his inventory number up front. You want to put what's up front. Maybe that's the name of the card or whatever. But I would just put postcard RPPC Women's Suffrage Parade Washington DC. You can put the date there. I can turn if he got the date. But some of that other stuff, the psycho and stuff, maybe that means, you know, the stamp box and stuff like that. It'll help data, but you got 1913 there already. And people are going to dig into this card. They're going to look at the back and stuff like that. So I would want to keep my title more clean and then get rid of all caps. Now, those are my opinions and what I do. Now, what you do is one thing. And what you think of my opinions is one thing. Just let me know in the comments. But all caps is harder to read. That's been known even in texting world. And it is, it is harder to read on there. And any slash marks quotations to take out. I capitalize like every other word, or every word, except for is, the, for, and stuff like that. That's the way I do it. It makes my listings look uniform. But this is, uh, using all caps, is just not a best practice. But $100. The next one was another one. Washington, D.C. Early Horse Drawn Taxi at Mansions, RPPC Postcard. You're selling a postcard RPPC, move it to the front. Move what you're selling to the front. Your R postcard RPPC, horse-drawn taxi, not early, at Mansion, Washington, D.C. That's the title I would use, and I'm sure you guys would rearrange it a little more and get rid of all the caps. $55 in an auction, $3.99. So he went for it to see if he can get for it, and he got $55. So he put his asking price in there. He tried, but he only got one bid. But he put in there probably what he wanted to get for that card. He was probably hoping for more, but he got what he wanted. That's how you do it. You don't put it in there for 99 cents, because that guy with one bid would have got it for 99 cents. you got to find that one right person, or you get two or three people in there bidding on these cards. Those are the auctions you see on YouTube and all that stuff. But this is how they... 
This is not normal. A lot of people will start them low, try to get people in there. But this guy did it right. He started it at a price that he wanted. Always wishing for more, but he didn't get two people going at it. $55. Next one is Trader Vic's Statler Hotel, Washington, D.C. Vintage Tiki Restaurant Postcard. Postcard up front is what I do. Make it uniform. $22. He got seven bids on there. So that was... That's another good one. So you get something like this, maybe auctions with some of these unique cards. They're getting kind of higher on there. Not too bad. And I would move the title around a little bit, but that's my opinion. So if you're looking at the highs in the, in the average care category, $55 to $70, because you got to take the low and take the average, I'd say $55 to $60, $55 to $70, if you get some real good cards and do your homework. Then you go over and you look at the sold low. They gotta keep giving this stuff away. 99 cents. Vintage postcard of antique cars by US Treasury. Washington DC, long ago. 99 cents. 55 cents shipping. You didn't make any money. 1939, Washington DC postcard. Harvey's famous restaurant. 107 Connecticut Avenue, linen. You know it's linen. And you probably wouldn't need to put the address in there, but you can do it. Dollar sixty. You could probably got more for that card. Looks like a night scene. They probably, they probably could have done a little bit better with that. Did some homework, clean up the title on there. The next one is very common card. Washington Monument, unsent and vintage. So unposted, unsent, all that stuff. I, I don't put that in the title. They can see the images. Don't waste your time typing. That's my opinion. It's what I do. And the word the. I don't use, try not to use the unless it's part of the title. And that part is in caps. And it's just harder to read. 99 cents. That's probably about right. I don't even list the Washington Monument anymore. I, I'll, I'll lot them up and put them in the flea, or put them in the flea market box. But I, I have enough of those in there. And they got 99 cents plus 65 cents shipping. Wasn't worth the time. Then we look at what people are listing these things for. I, I don't, I, I've listed this Pan American Union building, Washington C postcard unposted, 55-1915. I've listed it before, but if you look at it, and there's really nothing, nothing there that's uh, special that I know of. It, it is the Pan American building, they could get a few extra dollars, but there's just a lot of them out there. And I went out there and I found another one it's basically the same image, same picture, uh, colored up a little bit on a white, it looks like a white border, 1797. So this guy's got it $500 for one, and then I just found another one for $17, or best offer. That's what I'm talking about, just because you got an old postcard doesn't mean it's worth millions of dollars. I would, it, it took me less than a couple, just a couple minutes to find the $500 one and another couple minutes I think it was on the same page that I found this other one this white border of basically the same picture and a better looking card than the top one it, one's 1921 and one's 1915 not too far apart it looks like the same picture so you want to be careful with comps on listed next one is woman rights crowd awaiting suffrage parade RPPC Washington now this might be the same guy that had the other one and he put this for $205 or best offer. You never know. It, it, with the best offer in there, he's checking as long as you manage it and you can work it down and if you get a lot of offers in the hundred dollar area, hundred dollars, hundred dollars, hundred dollars, yeah, take the next hundred dollar one. But I think he's testing the market with this at a two hundred and five fifty. I, I don't know what two oh five fifty where that came from. It's kind of a weird number. That doesn't matter. But the woman's suffrage, those are can ask you can get good money for those. So I wouldn't say it's out of line. I think he needs to manage it as he goes through the best offer and see what he can get for it. What are people offering to him on there? I do I do, I do that all the time. Mint Vintage Washington C Memorial Continental Hall 13 Columbus 13 Columns 1920s postcard. Be careful with those subjective terms like mint and stuff. Your mint is not what my mint is. I, I try to stay away from those. Um, I, I don't grade postcards because 
you know, I don't put small scratch on action figures. I just put scratch, scuffed. I, de I don't try to put the subjective terms in there, small dent. Because small to some people might be huge to others. I've learned that over time with the action figures. I, I'm very careful, you know, uh, sh shelf wear, corner uh, turns, edge wear. Kind of keep it more generic and please view the photos and stuff like that. So Sam Mint can be, I mean, the thing's got to be mint. I mean, it's got to be like right out of the box. No damage at all. And you're going to get a lot of questions probably from people. 6906. It's on 15% sale. Yeah, that's a very that's another common card. All of these cards, except for that suffrage one, are pretty common cards that I can go out there and find any day of the week, almost on any postcard site. The listed low, again, we're Library of Congress, very common card, 99 cents. U.S. Capitol, dollar. What I do the most with the Capitol one is the night views with the moon and stuff like that. Those do better. Vintage postcard, Jefferson Memorial. That's a nice view there, but a dollar seventy-five. So all those are probably right. They're gonna, some teacher gonna use them, or somebody in a foreign country, or somebody wants the card in their collection and stuff like that. So I wouldn't say these are priced out of line, but they are gonna be very low sellers. You know, five percent sell through rate. Out of every hundred you got listed, you'll sell five, possibly. That's just an estimate. That's just a real quick, non-scientific <laughs> way that I look at things. It gives me a ballpark in there. But Washington, D.C. cards, I, I think, should be part of a store. People come in. You go to the department store. You want to hit all... You want something, it's in the store. Like, you go to Walmart or you go to Meyer or something in the department store. You can go to different departments. So, say you need pens and shampoo and cookies and milk. You can get all that in one place. So, if you have a nice variety in the store, different prices, stuff like that, people might buy four cards from you and then see the Washington DC one and add, just add that in and stuff like that. I That's how I think because I like to have a nice mixture because people do sometimes follow you and will shop in your stores on there. But Washington DC postcards, I see them. If I get them, I gotta make sure they're nothing special. If anything special, I'll research them. If not, then I decide if I'm gonna list them or not. And my minimum is gonna be 465, 455. And they probably won't move that often. So I, I kind of don't do them as much. Who knew? Now we get into the poll. But, and what I said before, the skew, inventory is probably one of the most passionate areas of postcard collectors and other people, how they store their stuff. And people always think they got the best way to do it. because They put a lot of time into it, a lot of passion and the way they think and everybody should do it their way. I'm not like that. As long as you got a system, I could care less how you store your postcards or how long it takes you to find one. But the people on here have given best practices and I have a lot of comments here. And I put this out here to get the comments because I wanted to see if people use the SKUs. You know, a lot of people tell me what I do is a waste of time. Uh, a lot of people like the way I do it. It's across the board. It, it shouldn't matter that often. I'm just showing how I do it and then when other people come in, is anything pop out that is a best practice that people do across the board that they found? So the question was, do you use the SKU number for your postcard inventory? So basically an individual number for each postcard. Instead of putting, like this card here, I'm, it's the Cottages of Our Lady of Ellen, Chicopee, Massachusetts. A lot of people would store this in M for Massachusetts. Some people would put it in... Uh, the shrine, it's whatever you do, or chrome in there. Well, that's fine, but once you build up to a thousand cards or so, it, it's harder and harder to identify them. But there's a lot of ways to do it. So the result, 62 people participated in this poll. 66% said yes, they use a SKU number. 31% said no. So some... They, they, they might not use it on every postcard, but a lot of people, what they've done is they'll put dividers in, and they say they got 10 dividers, and they'll put 20 cards per divider. And on that divider will be one, A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, A6. In the custom label field on eBay, it, they'll put A1. So they'll go over and they, they got to pick up 
they'll go to A1 and they'll pick up the 20 cards and they'll look through them. And as they get down, they know they can use A1 again. That's a, a lot of people use that. It works fine. It's how you, how you want to do it. How you think the space you have, etc. like that. But you want to get a system in place as early as possible. Uh, because you'll get to a point, if you're serious about postcards, where you, there's a point of no return. Like for me to change the way I do it, no, I'm not going to go through and change the way I do it. I'm I'm just going to putter through what I have. I think Biff Buffalo's the same way. He does his with states and stuff like that. He's at a point with so many cards, and Kelly probably is too. That's just the way they do it. They're used to it. It works. I got some flaws in mine. I'm sure they have a little bit of things they'd like to change on theirs. But we're not going to do it. We're thirty thousand over thirty thousand postcards. It's just not worth the time. I'd rather spend the extra 30 seconds to find a card than actually go through and change 30,000 cards for, to get that back. But I caught it early. I changed my inventory three times. And I caught it early. The last time I changed, it took a while because I had a lot more cards. But I, I'm glad I made the change because now this has worked better for me than it was the first two times. So basically, the way people talk about inventory, everybody comes up is trying to rebuild, build a new mousetrap. And that, just, this mousetrap here was built and was invented in 1894. It has trapped billions of mice since then. People, every day or every year, the patent office in Washington, D.C. gets 20 or so applications for a new mousetrap every year. And they only accept a few of them. I've got more mice with this little 50 cent trap than I did with the newest one I bought. I bought a couple of these. Look at this thing. It's got a door. It's got a place in the bike. Came in a nice blister pack. It says Kill Vault right on it. Look at that thing. This compared to this. I had to read the instructions on how what these little doors open and how this thing works. This thing ain't going to kill anything. It's a plastic spring. It's just going to hold them there until they die. I haven't caught any mice. I, can't I had to read the instructions. There's no effort in this. I've caught more. I've caught all my mice on this and that other one. So everybody's trying to build a new mouse trap when really you need to go back to basics and look at the simplest way to do it. Is it using skew numbers for you? Is it using the 20 per divider? Is it doing it by state? Stick with the basic plan and you're, you'll you'll save a lot of time. Don't try to build a new mouse trap. Don't don't make it too complicated. I see a lot of people with their racks. So I got two racks over there. And you might have seen it on the other video where I keep my toys. On the left, each rack can hold 15 boxes that I put my stuff in there. And the number on the box is what I put in the custom skew field, uh, label field. So I got 15 per shelf. Top left corner is number one. Bottom right corner of the second shelf is number 30. Americans read left to right. So 1 through 15 on the first shelf, 16 through 30 on the next shelf. Very simple. What I see a lot of people do, shelf 1, row 1, box 1A, shelf 1, box 2, or top row, box 2B, all these cryptic numbers in there. And then when they get to shelf two, they got shelf one, row one, what, they got to look at all the numbers. So, to me, I like simple. I don't even have to think. When I see box 23, I just go over, and there's 23, pull it out. I don't look for a row, shelf. I only got two shelves, and I'm the only one looking at it. So don't make it more cryptic than you need to, is what I tell people. Don't over-engineer it, I guess, is my recommendation. But you can do whatever you want. I, I really don't. It doesn't bother me. I don't have to look for the cards. And like I said, I have flaws in mine. I think I can, if I was to do it again, there are some things I would change. But I'm at a point where it's it just too much. <laughs> I'm not, not going to do that. But some of the comments I got might help also. The first one, and there is a few of these, so it might take a second for me to go through them. But I, I think this is a very important topic because you've got to get this under control when you first start and get serious about postcards. If you don't, you will. Uh, everybody I know, I did it. Everybody's been through the inventory part on postcards. So that dude, every one of my cards has a unique SKU. It makes him finding the exact cards so much easier. I have over 16,000 cards, 
congratulations, that's a good number. Cards listed. It was a lot of work to switch to that method. I'm so glad. So he might have caught it after he got a bunch of cards in there. So he probably said, oh, God, I need to change this. But he was at a point, he caught it before the point of no return. I don't have to search through groups or this of this or blocks of that anymore. I'm looking only at the specific SKU number when something sells. So he's using SKU numbers and he caught it before. Thanks for sharing that, dude. See, see the lights. Each card is a unique SKU that is also used as an image file name. I may list a card on multiple sites, so it's beneficial for when I have to upload images filed in numerical order. So they're easy to find. The return address labeled upper left corner makes searching easy with this system. I don't have to look through bags of cards to find the one that's sold. Yeah, when I scan photos and I upload them to eBay, I just delete them. Because I, if I want to go look for a folder uh, or a postcard picture, the thumbnails are so low, I just delete them and do it. But I'm glad you got a system. It sounds like you got it under control. Uh, you like what you got. Same with that dude and everybody else. I, when I read through these comments, I was very happy that people have a system because I know what I went through. You don't want to do what I did. Biff Buffo, I put a, he's got a lot of cards too. I put a date in the custom SKU so that when I end sell similar, it retains the listing date. So he's using that as a double way of doing things. It's the way he runs his business. Of course, if you have a numerical system, you will always have an idea of, of old listing. Is. Yeah, my box one over there has like number 4,000 or something in there. That's my lowest number. And then my other box, I think I'm at 60,000. I don't know, something like that. Cause I got quantity and I got other things I've listed. I use it, the SKU numbers for toys. So they bounce around. But my filing system is by city, which I prefer for a couple of reasons over numerical. And I think he explained that in another comment I talked about. But he's happy with it. And I think he said he's at a point of no return. He's going to live with what he's got. But everybody has a different wiring up there. Joe Mechanic, thanks, Biff, for your comment. I always appreciate your comments. Joe Mechanic, I use numbered SKUs for all postcards. Similar to you, but I place a divider every hundred. And instead, it printed stickers on each sleeve I, when I list. I say 20 Hot Wheels. They'll be stored in one box with SKUs of Hot Wheels 1 through 20 so I can grab and ship quickly. It's an abbreviation for yours and Popeye system. Yeah, take what you can. If you guys can just get one thing out of these videos, out of this 30 minutes or whatever you watch, if you can get one thing, that would be great. That's what I'm looking for. I'm not saying I got the answers or I'm the best postcard seller in the world or got the most postcards or I sell it for the best price. This is just a place for everybody that talks about postcards and like postcards and get into reselling or collecting has one place and everybody talks about the same thing. It's not like Facebook where everybody and their brother talks about everything. I don't even look at Facebook. If you guys ever see my name out there, I do have a Facebook that has some postcards, an Instagram, a TikTok. I put my thing on everywhere. I don't look at any of those. Instagram, every time I go to do that, it just drives me nuts. Facebook is just, those people, I just don't get involved with all those things. I like YouTube eBay, Etsy, whatnot. Those are the things I do. So if you leave me a message on Instagram, you're not going to get a response. Probably Facebook, too. I, I just don't... I, I had to pick. It was too spread out. I had to pick what I want. And that's what you got to do, too, is what do you, niche down. What do you want to do? If you try to sell everything, it'll drive you crazy. And I don't know everything about postcards. As you'll see in some of these videos, I when I research these cards, I learn so much about these cards that I just never knew before. That's why I like doing them. Too wonderful, it's a mix. Depending on what set of postcards they decide to list. If it's a set of 100 or 200, I usually put a SKU. Less than 30, I don't bother. Trying to learn this. All my cards listed have a unique SKU, but they are stored in blocks of 25. I have dividers every 25 cards. I see a lot of people use that method. Jay Smith, I use SKUs for groups of cards. SKU is based on date listed. Less typing, less risk of data entry error. Thanks, Jay. Bad eats moth. I would number each box and put the cards in bags of 50 and, and give each bag a number and give each card a number. So card 5 and bag 3 of box 2 would be written 235. Got a, got a system. And I think Bad Eat Moss also said he's getting out uh, selling his postcards. So if you can find his store, uh, he's selling them in lots. Wendy says, yes, yeah, skew and barcoded. 
makes doing inventory a breeze. I have a red card that I, I, I walk through my boxes. I think right now it's somewhere, I think it might be in box 6 again, or 16. I spot check my boxes. I'll put that red card just to spot check the boxes around and I'll grab like 5 cards out of that box. And just see if it's still on eBay and stuff. I've never found any that not still listed. They've all been in the same spot on eBay and everything, or Etsy and stuff like that. So I just spot checked. There's no way I'm going to do a full inventory. And Kelly has over 30,000 cards. He uses a SKU number for every 30 to 50 cards. And I think he uses those plastic Sterilite boxes and he puts them in there and stuff like that. So many different ways to do it. Keep it simple. You'll catch more mice. If you try to make it like this, I don't know, with all these little doors, this crazy kill vault, you're going to pay up on it and it's going to cost you. And I don't even know what this thing does. I forgot how I loaded it. i, I got to read the instructions again. I haven't caught anything on there. I've caught dozens of mice over the years on these. And I just throw the whole trap away. They're cheap. So make it simple. Don't make it hard. got any questions, i got videos out there how I do it. I talk about this a lot, so pick out what you need and make and just make it happen. But get it earlier than later. I'm just warning you from experience. That's the poll. Make sure you check them out in the community tab. I think it does send a notification out if you subscribe and hit the bell icon. It will send it out there when these go out. I think I just sent one the other night on something I'm doing research for and I want to know opinions about something. And some people have responded, so I appreciate that. Viewer comments. I do these at the end of every video. These are comments that come into people. A lot of them you guys don't see because they come in the email or they're hidden or stuff like that. Or I've gotten them other places or messages in eBay. Most of these, uh, I think all these, two of these are from YouTube. The other one's an email. Shriker20 says, I've sold Lewis Wayne for $50. So that's from my video, I think, right away postcards where I had the cats. I know the mans are cats, and Lewis Wayne comes to mind, but that didn't click on me when I did the video that it was the cats, and animal porphy cats. But, and when Stryker said that, I said, yeah, that's who it is. So he sold Lewis Wayne for $50. So those Lewis Wayne ones that you saw in that right away video that I just put out, you want to look for those anthropomorphic cats. He sold one for $50. That's why I thought I would share this comment. This is what you can learn from this channel, from not me, but from other people. So look for Lewis Wayne, and here's proof that you can sell these things for good money. Usually cat-related as that was what he was known for, anthropomorphized cats. Thanks, Shriker, for that information. And if anybody else has anything they want to put in comments, Stuff like this, it just helps everybody to find these cards and get them back out to the people that want them. And we might be pricing, underpricing some of these things or just don't know. That's a good comment. Thanks again. Bill's Business. I'm not really upset about eBay sellers who underpriced their listings. I think I talk about that all the time I do pricing. Uh, if, list, if a listing is priced way in the market, it will sell quickly and therefore not be competing against my listing. Sometimes, I would say yes and no. Or maybe. I agree with you, Bill. I, I do. Um, but what I think it is, there's uh Julie, I think, stated there's uh if you price something higher, people a uh, perceived value. If you price it too low, it's not a perceived like so there, to me it's a perceived value, like Julie said, on there. So those ninety nine cent cards might not sell. But I, I do agree with you. I, I see your point. Thanks, Bill. Thank you for your time and all your videos. I have learned a bunch and it has helped me list and sell more cards. Great. I, that's all I ask. I have filed my first claim with eBay protection on eBay standard envelope and received my money. Never knew this was an option. Thank you. And what this person's talking about is they've watched the videos and they've learned something. If they got one thing out of one video, uh, great. Uh, but the eBay sh uh, shipping protection is if you send something to eBay standard envelope and it says the the customer says they did not receive it. You can refund them and get your money back by filing a claim. I did a video about that, and I walk you through the whole process. I just did one again the other day. I got my money back in two three days. Sure, it's only five bucks, but it adds up uh, on there. So you really have a full protection on that eBay standard envelope if you use it. But watch that video, 
and it'll walk you through where to get all the information and stuff like that and how I track it. So you can't put it in, it has to be over 30 days and now no later than 90. So you have a, should have a way to track it a little bit and it goes by the shipping label date on there. But I'm glad, I'm glad you're using it. A lot of people have said the same thing. They really didn't know how to do it or they didn't know about it. And some people said they've known about it and they've used it. So I'm glad I'm reaching the right people on that. That's why I did that video. Now with Washington DC comes to mind patriotic postcards. Check this video out here to learn more about patriotic postcards. They're hit and miss for me. I bought a bunch of George Washingtons and stuff like that. I think I finally put them on whatnot and got rid of them. Thanks for watching. That's all I got for you today. Good luck out there. And I'll catch you on the next one. Thanks.